Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in this session we are going to talk on another area in comparative politics. Today we are going to talk on party and party systems in India. Uh, we are going to discuss the classification of the party system as well as we are going to give you in-depth knowledge on trends of the parties and at last we are going to discuss on the problems faced by the parties, problems with the parties and for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios, Dr. Satish Kumar Shah. Dr. Satish Kumar Jha is Associate Professor in Department of Political Science, Arjabhatta College, University of Delhi. Dr. Jha has immense experience and he is contributing a lot in the area of academics so that the student community is benefited as whole. So let's welcome our guest Dr. Satish Kumar Jha and let's try to understand party and party systems in India. Hello sir, welcome to the lecture. Thank you Geetha Ji and good afternoon. Uh, today's uh, lecture we are going to devote on party and party system uh, in India. Uh, something uh, what we discussed in uh, context of comparative politics, the general theoretical uh, formulations, uh, theoretical uh, debates and discussions. Uh, today we are specifically concerned with the Indian scenario. Uh, that how uh, you know scholars have looked at the Indian uh, political system and how they have analyzed uh, parties and party system in India. Uh, one thing is uh, you know is important to remember at the very outset that India as a developing country uh, or a third world country uh, is uh, some sort of an aberration in whole uh, you know third world uh, you know third world or one can say that among the developing nations uh, in the sense that it has not only successfully practiced uh, a liberal democratic institutions uh, and uh, a constitutionalism uh, but in fact the parties also have gradually you know evolved and uh, got institutionalized and therefore uh, unlike many other countries who started their democratic journey with India and also collapsed like house of cards, uh, India offers altogether different uh, picture. So that is one thing and that is why you know it has att attracted a lot of uh, you know attention uh, from scholars uh, both in India as well as in West uh, particularly political scientists have looked at the Indian uh, you know scenario with a lot of interest and a lot of curiosity uh, that how to understand uh, the success of India's democracy. So success of democracy in India is basically uh, has you know, resulted due to many factors that is perhaps not the subject matter for today's discussion. But one thing is very important here to mention that parties have also played important role and particularly uh, you know the role of Congress party in that context is widely acknowledged because India fought its freedom movement uh, under the leadership of Indian National Congress which was founded in 1885 and that is perhaps also the first instance when uh, you know a birth of political party in modern sense of the term one can trace that is 1885 the birth of Indian National Congress. It is a different matter that Congress at that time was more of a movement than a party in a strict uh, sense of the term the way it is defined. But nonetheless even if it started as a political party in format of a movement which included many ideological currents which existed in society at that point of time but gradually it evolved as a political party uh, even in phase of uh, you know the mass movement and mass struggle that is 1920s uh, particularly the Gandhian phase even in that period we find that party I mean the attempts were made to organize it on pattern of a political party uh, and that is why you know the Nagpur Congress of uh, Congress in 1920 is quite significant uh, you know what happened. Uh, in that you know uh, in, uh, in Congress entire organizational structure was uh, overhauled. So this is, this is how uh, we find the beginning of political parties. We will come to this issue later that how uh, you know Indian National Congress was the first important political formation in India and since then we have seen uh, that along with Congress many other ideological currents, many ideological political formations have emerged and today in fact one can say that India offers a very interesting and unique case of a multi-party system with a lot of ideological divisions or a lot of ideological uh, you know polarizations and also symmetries and asymmetries. All these issues we will be touching in course of our uh, discussion. One thing uh, you, know, uh, you know we often remember uh, when we discuss political party particularly that famous statement of you know La Palambra 
uh, who is credited with giving this concept of predominant party system and Maren Werner, uh, an American political scientist, a very keen observer of Indian political uh, situation and scenario. Uh, in fact, they point out that the one important feature of modern po political party is one of the important features of modern and modernizing uh, societies. So therefore, no society one can say in today's context, particularly one which is practicing uh, democratic you know, institutes a democratic system or democratic ideas can survive without, uh, you know, the, uh, without having a political agency called, called political party. Of course, it is a different matter, uh, which we also discuss in context of our debates in comparative politics on party and party system, uh, that, you know, in parliamentary democratic system, on the one hand, parties are indispensable. Uh, without political parties, parliamentary democracy cannot be thought of particularly the way it has got institutionalized in Anglo-Saxon world. But interestingly, if one does a survey of, you know, the constitutions of parliamentary democracies, one will rarely find, rather one will not find uh, any instance of uh, any instance where political party has been constitutionalized. One can say that political parties have an extra constitutional growth in parliamentary uh, democratic systems, including Britain or for that matter, uh, many other countries. And India is no exception. That's why India's constitution, which is considered to be a voluminous document, but does not mention party at, at any point of, uh, at an, any stage or at any, in any of its part. In fact, only the 1985 52nd Amendment, that was Anti-Defection Act, when it was uh, enacted by the parliament that for the first time the term political party occurs in India's constitution in 10th schedule when it was added, 10th schedule was added through 52nd amendment. So therefore on the one hand, uh, parliamentary democracies cannot be imagined, cannot be thought of uh, existing without political party as a political uh, agency. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a glaring omission of you know political parties from constitutional documents. So that is there. So, in fact, uh, that is, of course, a matter of uh, further research that why this has happened and how it has happened. And interestingly, as I mentioned in our, our discussion on comparative politics when discussing political parties, that most of the important theoreticians, uh, you know, those uh, thinkers, those scholars who have reflected on political parties, they also do not come from Anglo-Saxon world, which one can say, uh, you know, was basically... Uh, the main, uh, you know, uh, or one can say the epicenter of parliamentary democratic ideas and, uh, you know, thinking, uh, be it Britain or United States of America or Canada or for that matter, many other countries. In fact, most of the thinkers who have reflected on political party have come from continental Europe. For example, Max Weber, uh, one can say Duvaja, uh, Sartori, Mitchells, the four important names which immediately comes, you know, the names which come to our mind when we discuss political party. All of them belong to the continental Europe, not Anglo-Saxon world. So this is one issue which should remember, even if you are discussing the Indian uh, scenario, that political parties in India also have extra constitutional existence. Uh, in fact, one can say that Indian constitution uh, does not uh, mention it. But nonetheless, as I mentioned, that this is perhaps an indispensable uh, to any representative democracy and therefore India being a representative democracy, political parties have a special significance. Of course, when democracy is practiced at, as a, you know, in larger aggregates, then you know you need representational devices and therefore once you need de representational devices, then party becomes a very important represent representational device to basically mediate civil society and the state institutions and therefore this mediatory role of political party particularly in terms of interest aggregation is something all of us to remember when we discuss political party of course it is a different matter that in the entire uh, you know comparative politics and political theory today scholars are debating the decline of political parties particularly they believe that parties are in a stage of terminal decline particularly uh, if we look at them in terms of the life and times uh, their times, particularly the way they are declining, is something uh, very, you know, alarming. But of course, that is something, uh, you know, a different matter to debate and discuss that why parties are de declining, why new social movements are posing new challenges, the alternative channel, channels for representation are emerging, uh, not only, uh, you know, outside India, even in India. 
Uh, in fact, uh, most of the political parties face a lot of criticism. Even in recent years, we have seen that many social movements, you know, new social movements have emerged, uh, which claim to represent the interest of people in civil society. And they also claim that political parties no longer is a custodian of the interest of people in civil society. For example, anti-corruption movement was the best example when they started attacking the existing political parties, which is basically known as Anna movement. So therefore, in fact, this issue uh, is important uh, in India as well. Now, one thing is to be remembered here that in political theory, in comparative politics, there has been a trend from the very beginning. Uh, particularly that can be called anti-party sentiments. And therefore, it is not only in the United States where Washington is uh, basically seen representing this anti-party sentiment uh, because parties are considered to be uh, divisive, uh, particularly in terms of organic unity of national community. Uh, they are considered to be, uh, you know, faction-ridden and therefore, uh, you know, giving rise to some uh, you know, uh, some tendencies in democracy which have not been endorsed by many people. So it is not only Washington, but even in India, Gandhi, uh, Jayaprakash Narayan, M. N. Roy, uh, many others, one can see that, you know, they talked about non-party political process. Even eminent political scientist Rajni Kothari, in fact, took forward this debate in 70s uh, in this direction that how non-party political process is the future of democracy in India. Of course, uh, that is uh, a different issue. But one thing what I would like to mention here, that conservative liberals, particularly, you know, those protagonists, uh, or one can say uh, that, you know, advocates of mass movement, the, you know, popular will, uh, general uh, will, one can say the popular sovereignty, uh, those thinkers have always uh, looked askance at political party. They have always uh, expressed the reservation on political party as agent of uh, politics or agency through which people's interests could be promoted and further. So therefore, this is something uh, at the outset we should remember. Now coming to India, I mentioned that, you know, in modern times, of course, political parties are considered to be a modern phenomenon. Because earlier, of course, there were, you know, court parties, there were different type of factions in the courts of the kings and emperors. But nonetheless, this new phenomenon that parties as a political you know, agent of the people, this is totally new. And in India, one can say that with colonial modernity, with the advent of colonial modernity, particularly after the colonial, the East India Company established its rule over India, what we find, and particularly after 1857, when this, you know, uh, takeover by the British Parliament took place, uh, you know, the reign of power in India, uh, on 1883, uh, you know, what is normally called Ripon's reform, because Ripon's reforms were the first instance when democratic process was basically unleashed, or one can say initiated at the local level, the grassroots level, uh, in form of local self-government, district boards and other things. And this is how the first time the elections also came to India, uh, electoral democracy came to India. So therefore, uh, you know, this is, you know, around this time that we find uh, that, you know, uh, that this uh, entire political party and political process, a uh, democratic political process got initiated. And many scholars trace the origin of political party around that time. Now, after 1883, uh, Ripon reform, 83-84, what we find uh, that, you know, 1885, the Indian National Congress is founded in India. The first, po basically, political party taking shape, taking birth in India. Of course, as it is well known that it was formed, uh, the initiative was taken by, uh, you know, a Britisher, a Hume. And uh, the purpose was, of course, uh, altogether different. As it is normally believed that the Hume wanted to uh, use Congress or the basically help founding this Congress as a party uh, to, as a safety world. Uh, that, you know, this will be on one platform where the rulers and the rule, they will come together and the rulers should be able to know in advance, uh, you know, the grievances uh, of the people and therefore they could take remedial measures because 1857, uh, that, you know, that struggle was fresh in their minds when it got exploded and they were caught totally unaware. So they thought that such platforms, such interacting an interactive, you know, platform would provide them an, uh, you know, uh, an opportunity 
to know in advance the minds of the people. That was the purpose. It is a different matter. Historians have uh, called that, uh, historians have observed that if Hume and the Britishers wanted to use it as safety valve, they basically, the Indian nationalists turned it into lightning conductor because they used it as a shield against the onslaught of the coercive apparatus of the state and therefore used it to their benefit. But what I'm basically interested in here to mention that this is the first instance that, you know, the parties, one can say the political party uh, comes to India, is formed, is institutionalized, Indian National Congress. As I mentioned earlier, it was not a party in a strict sense of the term because it was some sort of a movement. Uh, of course, the Congress, the term also is suggestive. It comes from, you know, a North American history because American parliament is called Congress. So therefore, Indians thought that, you know, if they didn't have the political power in their hands, but nonetheless, they could use this formation, this, they could use this platform as a parliament, a virtual parliament, where they will be basically educated uh, in the art of governance. They will be educated in art of legislation. So therefore, uh, as it is commonly, uh, you know, known that Congress played multiple roles in that context educative role, a democratic role, uh, a ro agitational role, a number of roles it discharged from time to time. So therefore the Congress was founded with a different, with, with a definite context, uh, with a purpose, with a mission and accordingly it moved ahead. And therefore it became a movement, many, many scholars observed that it was less of a party and more of a movement. Because uh, as it is normally seen in movement, there are many ideological currents which were present in, within uh, the Indian National Congress. On the one hand, uh, you had the Hindu Mahashava. On the other hand, you have the left-wingers like Congress Socialist Party. On the other hand, you have the right-wingers in economics uh, matters. You had the left-wingers in political matters. So therefore, it included number of ideological currents. Even, you know, the Muslim League, uh, you know, the Scheduled Caste Federation, uh, you know, some of the Dravidian parties always had, uh, you know, from time to time, uh, interaction, collaboration, pacts, alliances, and so on and so forth. So, therefore, it was some sort of a movement. Now, on basis of the evolution of political parties since then, since 1885, uh, you know, one can say that the entire party system in India can be seen in terms of five waves of democratization. And all five waves are characterized by certain new trends in party, uh, you know, in the functioning of parties. And this is how one can say that some sort of systemic tendencies one can figure out. And one can say that, you know, a party system uh, has evolved gradually in India. Of course, as it is well known that from the very beginning, India has been a multi-party system. Uh, in fact, more than two parties have always existed. India has never witnessed a two-party, you know, two-party system the way perhaps it exists in some of the Western democracies. Interestingly, as we discuss in context of comparative politics, that Duverger's law, that majoritarian system, first post the past system gives rise to two-party system, and India has first past the post system, a majoritarian system, plurality system, but nonetheless, it has defied Duverger's law. India has never basically gone in direction of two-party system. And therefore, many people say that India is a fit case to challenge Duverger's law, particularly in terms of their electoral system and the parties, kind of party system it uh, gives, you know, it gives birth to. So this is how, on basis of, you know, uh, the trends, one can say that five waves of democratization uh, in India since 1920s. Why I'm saying 20s? Because 20 is significant. The Congress, Indian National Congress was formed in 1885. But one, one can say that its major transformation starts from 1905. That is anti-partition movement, partition of Bengal, which is also known as Swadeshi movement. Uh, when it is argued that it started becoming a mass movement. But the real transformation starts after 1920s with the, you know, with advent of Congress, with advent of Gandhi on the political horizon when the Congress machinery was overhauled, when Congress basically switched over from politics of prayer, petition and pressure to agitational mode and started agitating for its demand. And therefore, that was perhaps the beginning of, one can say, the first wave of democratization in India. And here, 
the basically the beginning of one can say a new trend in party system getting crystallized. Now, what is uh, on basis of these five waves as I mentioned, uh, those five waves can be, can be put as the first is the movement party system. On basis of these waves, if one makes an attempt to classify political party or tries to give you know parties a systemic form, uh, one can say that one can say that you know the first is the movement party system uh, because you know the party system here can be seen in terms of a movement, not strictly in terms of a party. And here one can say that 1920 to 1947. The second is, of course, is well known a theoretical construct. Uh, given by eminent Indian political scientist Rajni Kothari, uh, who called it Congress system. That is 1952, that is the first parliamentary election, to 1969, when Congress for the first time, uh, you know, uh, started showing sign of decline. Uh, when, you know, Congress was dislodged from power in many uh, provinces, many regions, many states. Even at national level, Congress witnessed a very, you know, dwindling of its support, particularly the strength in parliament. So therefore, this period, which is also known as the Nehruvian period, this is this has been called by Rajini Kothari at Congress system. Of course, uh, other scholars, for example, Morris Jones call it, uh, calls it one party dominant system. In fact, uh, as I was mentioning, La Palambra's predominant party system is basically, uh, you know, used to make such characterization. But Kothari's Congress system is uh, more uh, you know, uh, in fact, original formulation, more creative formulation, because though he is using the premise of predominant party system, one party dominant system, but through his formulation of Congress system, he makes really a creative, uh, you know, uh, you know, creative uh, observation. Uh, he makes a creative, he does a creative thinking uh, in terms of explaining the functioning of Congress. Uh, through this system, that is Congress system. I will come to this issue that how, what is Congress, what is Kothari's Congress system. Now, the third phase, after 1969, we find the third phase crystallizing in Indian politics from 1971 to 77. And this phase, at, you know, has been called by many scholars, including Professor M.P. Singh and others, as a confrontationist phase. In fact, this phase uh, is the phase when basically, you know, Indira Gandhi, uh, you know, consolidated her hold on Indian politics and immediately uh, after, you know, securing a massive mandate, 1971 election uh, with Garibi Hatao, nationalization of bank, abolition of privy purses, Indo-Pak war and many other things, immediately came, came up, you know, he confronted a lot of, uh, you know, agitation and opposition and two of them were very important, Nam Nirman movement in Gujarat and JP movement uh, which started from Bihar but spread to different parts of India. And finally, uh, you know, proclamation of emergency in 1975 and uh, Indira Gandhi losing power in 1977 and coming to the power for the first time a non-Congress uh, government, that is the Janta Party government. So this is the third phase, 71 to 77, and this has been called confrontationist phase in Indian party system. The fourth phase, is called, uh, a, you know, a kind of differentiation phase. Uh, basically, differentiation in the sense that for the first time, this national regional differentiation in terms of political parties uh, got crystallized. And in this differentiation phase, what we find that 1980s, uh, it is the beginning, with the beginning of 1980s. Uh, on the one hand, Mrs. Indira Gandhi comes back to power. Janta Party loses power. On the other hand, we find that a new trend uh, surfaces in Indian politics. And this is how this differentiation between national and regional, uh, you know, political formations happens. Of course, one should remember that that does not mean that before 1980 there were no regional parties. The regional parties in India, in South, Deep South, uh, that was the area uh, from the very beginning of regionalization of politics, particularly Dravid Dravidian parties. There were regional formations uh, in uh, other parts of India, including Jammu and Kashmir, National Conference. There were regional parties, particularly the separatist parties in northeastern states. But what happened that 1980, even some other areas which had not witnessed such regionalized, regionalization of parties, of political formations, uh, or political parties, that started taking place. And therefore, what happens that Telugu Desham Party, 
of you know uh, win selection in Andhra Pradesh. Janata Party, though it was not a regional party in strict sense of the term because it had a national presence, but nonetheless Ramakrishna Hegde comes to power in Karnataka. Uh, you know, national conference, uh, you know, and uh, Telugu Desham, Janata Party in Karnataka, Akali Dal in Punjab, and many other parties now start a new initiative. And this is perhaps a new churning on federal question, regional autonomy, regional disparity, regional backwardness, resource devolution, what is called fiscal federalism, along with, uh, you know, the son of the soil movement, which started in Assam, Assam Gun Sangram Parishad, particularly in 1982 And, uh, you know, Maharashtra, of course, had a son of the soil movement, the Shiv Shena and others. But, you know, this Assam Gun Parishad, Akali Dal, Telugu Desham, Janta Party, National Conference, all of them got mobilized against centralization of power in Indian democracy and they started demanding more federalization of polity, more resource devolution and so on and so forth. It is in this context that in this phase, what I have called the fourth phase, differentiation phase, that Sarkaria Commission is basically instituted to uh, you know, review central state relations in India. So this phase is very important from the point of view of party system, particularly the kind of trends which emerged in this phase, uh, in fact, lasted long. Some of them have survived today because what has happened, uh, particularly after 89, I'm coming to that issue, that one can say that Indian politics has got, Indian polity has got federalized and regionalized. Uh, with the, I mean, you know, the, the dominance and the important role which regional parties have played in the formation of national government. And the fifth phase is the deepening of this regionalized multi-party system with federal coalitions and minority government, particularly beginning in 1989 with B.P. Singh's, uh, you know, uh, National Front. So therefore, uh, you, know, you know, this is how one can say that it, the fifth page is perhaps more deepening of this regionalized multi-party system, which started in 1980 at differentiation page. So this is the fifth page. And the sixth page, of course, uh, is the current page, uh, where again, uh, you know, scholars point out that this, uh, you know, regionalization of uh, parties or one kind of regionalization of polity has slightly declined uh, with BJP coming back to power in 2014 with majority uh, at its own, though still it is an NDA uh, which is basically ruling India. But nonetheless, BJP on its own could muster uh, the majority support uh, in the parliamentary election. And there are other trends in this phase. Uh, where, you know, earlier it was anti-Congressism which united opposition parties. Now, in this page, it is all argued that the anti bjpism which is perhaps the glue of uh, non-BJP BJP parties to come together, along with the ideological polarization on certain issues which is happening. So, this is the sixth phase which is going on. So, around these six types or six phases, one can have a proper understanding of party system in India. So therefore, we have to look at all these six pages in more detail. With this note, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much for giving us this uh, session on party and party systems in India. Friends, you are requested to be with us as we are back after a short break. Thank you.
Hello friends, welcome back to the session. Friends, as you know that today we are talking on party and party system in India. We discussed a lot in our previous session and we left uh, with mentioning of uh, six phases. Now in this session we are going to elaborate on all those uh, six phases as well as we are going to discuss the problems with the parties. And for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios, Dr. Satish Kumar Chha. Dr. Satish Kumar Chha is Associate Professor in Department of Political Science, Aryabhat College, University of Delhi. So let's welcome our guest, Dr. Satish Kumar Shah. Hello, sir. Welcome to the lecture. Thank you. In fact, uh, in the last uh, session of our discussion, we were discussing, uh, you know, Indian parties and party system. And in that context, we saw that how scholars have, uh, you know, characterized uh, Indian party system in terms of six waves of democratization. And those six uh, waves are basically the period, time period when one can say that certain trends have, you know, surfaced in Indian uh, politics and Indian political process. Now, it is uh, to be remembered here that in comparative politics, number of attempts have been made to theorize, uh, you know, party system. And, uh, you know, the most important, uh, you know, of, uh, contributions uh, of, you know, uh, of scholars like, uh, you know, Duberger, uh, Shartori and many others uh, are often mentioned when one discusses party system in any country. Now, one thing is very clear that most of these scholars talk about, uh, you know, two party system, multi party system. Of course, Shartori has slightly more elaborate, uh, you know, discussion on this when, uh, you know, it talks of seven different types of uh, party, uh, you know, system, uh, you know, from predominant party. Uh, you know, one party, you know, the two party, and then finally coming to the three different types of multi-party system, moderate pluralism, polarized pluralism, atomized pluralism. Now, one thing is very clear that in spite of having, uh, you know, tradition of predominant party system in India, and uh, predominant party system, of course, was for the first time used by La Palambara, as I mentioned earlier also, uh, and predominant party system argument is that uh, in some many developing countries, uh, what happened uh, that anti-colonial fight was spearheaded by one political party and therefore the kind of legitimacy it gained in the eyes of the people after they attained independence, those parties which had spearheaded the movement started playing predominant role and therefore they became hegemonic. And therefore this predominance uh, was could not be dis challenged uh, by any other political party for a long period of time and this is on this basis that Maurice Jones theorized about one party dominant system in India, that Congress was this predominant party in La Palambara's sense and therefore it was a one party dominant system and other parties were revolving around it without having any chance or prospect of dislodging it. But one thing is there that in spite of having lot of similarity with this characterization of pre predominant party system, India from the very beginning has offered, uh, you know, a situation or offered an instance where one can say that this characterization of party system in terms of multi-party system is more appropriate for India. Now from very beginning India has witnessed not two parties, not one party, not two parties, but multiple parties. Of course, it is a different matter that monopoly on power was retained, was retained by Congress. Uh, in fact, it was ruling both the center and the states. But nonetheless, in fact, existence of political parties were always there and the number was always more than two. So therefore, uh, it is one can say is a multi-party system. Now within multi-party system, uh, if one can use Sartre's uh, formulation, a uh, moderate pluralism, polarized pluralism, atomized pluralism, then one can say, and this formulation of Sartre is based on two things, ideological distance and number counts. Uh, you know, moderate pluralism that it should be, parties should be like 5 and 6 and ideological distance is not that much pronounced or that much sharp. Uh, one can say that India comes very close to moderate pluralism. Uh, but of course, the number of parties is always more than 5, 6. In spite of election commission, a constitutional body uh, it has a mechanism to recognize political parties. Or on basis of that recognition, uh, you know, three types of parties uh, you know, are, you know, uh, uh, normally three types of parties emerge. Uh, one is national party, the regional party. The third is uh, one is a recognized, registered parties or recognized parties. Uh, and that is on basis of the percentage of votes they get, 6% votes in more than four states, 
then you become a national party. And then there are the criteria as well. Then there are regional parties who do not fulfill it, but you know, fulfill other criteria laid down for regional parties, they become regional parties. And then there are also uh, those parties who neither fulfill regional you know, criteria to become a regional party, nor fulfill the criteria of national party, they become uh, you know, the recognized party. The criteria is very simple. The national parties, the 6% vote uh, in four states or four MPs, uh, you know, in parliament. And the third is that 2% of, uh, you know, uh, of, uh, of seats. Uh, so this is the criteria for national parties. And also the MPs should be from three different states. So this for national party, there are four criteria. Then for the state parties, that those who are less than 6% of votes, but two member to the Bidham Sabha, that is the legislative assembly of a state, and 3% seats in that particular state, they are basically liable to be called uh, state parties or regional parties. And then the third is the registration parties, those who are registered with uh, election commission, but they do not fulfill uh, this criteria. So what I am trying to say, that election commission has evolved a criteria to recognize parties as regional and national. And if one does a count, then one finds that number of parties exist in India, both uh, particularly regional and the registered parties. National parties, of course, there was a time when Congress, BJP and left parties were you know, recognized as national parties. BJP Congress uh, remain national parties, but left has basically vacated that sheet particularly after the last election. So this is how one can say that moderate pluralism of, uh, you know, of uh, Sartari uh, applies in terms of ideological distance, which is not that sharp, but, uh, you know, in terms of number, uh, it does not fulfill that criteria. Sometimes one can say that is a polarized pluralism of Sartari, where the ideological distance is very sharp and the number is more than six. So number-wise, of course, it comes closer to this polarized pluralism. But ideological sharpness, a uh, lot of people say that it is still not that much. There is a lot of consensus on many issues, at least among two political parties, Congress and BJP. There is a lot of consensus on economic policies, economic reforms, particularly after 91. On cultural and on, you know, on uh, political issues, religion, but cultural and religious issues, of course, ideological distance is quite sharp between Congress and BJP. But nonetheless, one can say that on many issues, there is a lot of consensus still in existence. And therefore, that polarization, that ideological polarization, of course, a lot of scholars say that in recent years, one can say that, pol that polarization taking place uh, between the BJP and non-BJP parties. But nonetheless, the kind of polarized pluralism, uh, you know, the, which Sartari talks, uh, may not apply to India. Similarly, atomized pluralism, the third multi-party uh, you know, characterization of Sartari also, you know, does not apply to India because atomized pluralism is basically when there is no ideological coherence, there are fence sitters, today one party is this side, tomorrow that party would be that side, that type of, you know, turmoil or fluid situation is, uh, exist, exists in the atomized pluralism, so therefore that is also out of question. So therefore what I am trying to say that even Sartari's formulation of multi-party system with three different types, uh, moderate, polarized and atomized cannot be, you know, applied to Indian situation in the same form because India of course defies uh, these rules and therefore Indian party system has to be seen on its own terms that how one can analyze Indian party system. Uh, now here, uh, the first, as I said, that the six, uh, five, six waves of democratization throwing a new, uh, you know, trends and therefore on basis of that one can try to figure out that what a system has, go, you know, evolved, what system has got stabilized in India. The first phase, as I mentioned uh, before our break, was this, uh, you know, the movement party uh, system phase. Um, that is basically 1920 onwards, when Congress, which was formed in 1885, uh, became, uh, you know, a very prominent phase of this movement of Indian people for independence. And therefore, as I mentioned, that Indian National Congress was formed for a different purpose. Uh, many scholars have pointed out it was essentially a pressure group which was formed to lobby uh, support for participation of Indians in governance and administration uh, and number of similar issues, particular issues which pertain to middle class. But in course of time, it became a mass movement in a party for 
organizing mass movement. It went into agitational mode. 1905 anti-partisan movement and the Swadeshi movement was the first instance when it showed such inclination. By 1920, when Gandhi comes on the scene and Satyagraha and non-cooperation movement starts, there, thereby we find that a transformation of the Congress from uh, you know, mendicancy from the period of prayer, petition and pressure to this mass, uh, you know, to the movement party phase, one can say, begins in India. Now, of course, Congress, as I was mentioning, was a national platform. Well, all organizations, uh, you know, of the period, uh, be it, uh, you know, the Hindu Mahasava, Muslim League, Scheduled Caste Federation, or some of the Dravidian parties of the South, in one way or other, either they cooperated or uh, conflicted with the Congress, but nonetheless they had an engagement. And therefore one can say that some of them also had reconciliation and pacts with the Congress on number of issues, on reservation, on, you know, on, on federal issues, Muslim League Congress on federalism, set, you know, scheduled caste on a reservation, and so many other issues. So therefore Congress became the center of gravitation. And parties which existed at that time had either conflictual or the cooperative relationship with the Congress. And therefore, even the communists, which have, after its formation in 1925, what we find that communists uh, collaborated, cooperated with Congress and also drifted. Uh, you know, particularly the sectarianism of the left politics in India in 1930s, after the 6th Congress of Communist International, Comintern. Therefore, uh, you know, even the communists, uh, one can say, had cooperative and conflictual relationship. Not only uh, Muslim League and Scheduled Caste Federation. Even the Hindu Mahasabha, which was formed in 1915, and, uh, you know, Rashtriya Sangh Sangh, which was formed in 1925, they also at times operated from this platform. Uh, and, of course, the socialists already had its origin within the Congress when the Congress Socialist Party was formed. So this is how the first phase can be seen as a movement party uh, system phase. Uh, when, uh, you know, party got transformed into movement, movement accommodated a number of ideological currents, and therefore, uh, you know, it was the beginning of the first uh, phase of party system in India. Now, the second phase uh, of the, con you know, this, uh, you know, this entire party system in India uh, which I mentioned that from 1952 uh, to 1969. Why 52? Because 52 we had a general election based on the Republican Constitution, uh, you know, which came into existence in 1950. So therefore, the beginning of a new phase, and this is what is called as Nehruvian phase, and I also mentioned that Maurice Jones called it one-party dominant system, and Rajni Kothari talks of a Congress system. One thing is very clear, that most of the parties which came into existence around that, that time basically had their antecedents within the Congress. Uh, in fact, except perhaps uh, the Communist Party which was formed in 1925, uh, you know, after being inspired by Marxist, uh, you know, uh, Leninist ideology and had some connection with Communist International. But many of them had their antecedents within the Congress. Uh, so what one finds that this 1960. 52 to 69 phase is very crucial uh, for democratization, for evolution of party system in India, for crystallization of uh, trends in Indian politics which had long-lasting impact. Now, this Congress system of Rajini Kothari, uh, because in 60s he wrote series of articles in Economic Weekly, Form and Substance Indian Politics, and later on when he, you know, published a book, you know, Politics in India, we got a clear, clearer uh, idea of what Congress system he was talking of. Of course, uh, he also uh, talked in Asian Survey article, Asian Survey Journal, uh, about this Congress system before this politics in India was published. Now, Kothari's Congress system uh, is basically, uh, you know, is uh, painted in a manner, or one can say that he formulates the formulation of Congress system of Kothari, talks of a party of consensus, and calls Congress is a party of consensus. And then along with the party of consensus, there is also party of pressure. Uh, the pre party of pressure, are, according to Kothari, the non-Congress parties which exist on the margin of the political formation or the polity. So therefore, on the, in the center, you have a party of consensus, that is Congress, which reflects a national consensus on many issues, economic development, social issues, cultural issues, 
and on important values, uh, you know, the of constitutional values. So they ref Congress reflect that consensus, national consensus. And on the margin, you have the party of pressures. And they are mostly the non-Congress political party. Now, according to Kothari, there, are, there were certain supporting factors uh, behind this type of arrangement where Congress basically enjoyed, uh, you know, full legitimacy in the eyes of the people. And therefore, uh, you know, it was considered as a natural party uh, to rule or a, uh, you know, a natural party of governance. Now, what were the supporting factors? According to Kothari, uh, in his formulation of Congress system, the first supporting factor was the institutional charisma uh, for invincibility of Congress. And that in institutional charisma was largely on account of its participation in freedom movement. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, it gained a lot of legitimacy in the eyes of the people. The second was the personal charisma of some of their leaders, some of its leaders, including India's first Prime Minister Nehru. The third was a divided opposition, because our opposition parties were thoroughly divided. They didn't have any, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, unity among them, and therefore they were on the margins. So therefore what happened, that in this Congress system, uh, you know, the non-Congress parties had practically, uh, you know, no chance of forming the government and the Congress combined within it both the role of the government and role of the opposition. So one can say that it was not only a party which was ruling, it was not the party which was governing, but also it contained within it uh, the role of opposition. So Congress was discharg discharging this double role, role of a government, role of a party in government and role of a party in opposition. Now one can say, or Kothari's Congress system says that more effective opposition within this phase, that is the phase of Congress system, came from Congress dissidents, then from, uh, you know, the formal opposition parties like Swatantra Party, Socialist Party, Communist Party, or Bharatiya Janshan, which was basically uh, the BJP in its earlier incarnation. So therefore, more effective opposition came from the dissidents within the Congress than these opposition parties because they uh, didn't carry much weight, uh, particularly in electoral uh, politics. Now, what happened that these non-Congress parties had closer understanding and interaction with the like-minded Congress faction. This is something very in interesting. That both of the, you know, the both space, the space within, uh, you know, the ruling party and the space outside the ruling party, there were a lot of ideological, you know, liaisoning or one can say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, contacts. And therefore, non-Congress parties had closer understanding and interaction with the like-minded uh, Congress factions. For example, a left-leaning non-opposition party had uh, understanding and interaction with the left-leaning Congress leaders. Similarly, right-leaning, uh, right uh, you know, the opposition party leaders had some understanding with right-leaning Congress leaders. So therefore, this space uh, differentiation also got blurred under this Congress system. And it was this, through this mechanism of this, uh, you know, the interaction and uh, one can say the uh, uh, interaction or one can say that uh, dialogue uh, that, you know, uh, this dissident congressmen were often able to dislodge the ministerialist uh, and they used to come to power. So basically within Congress, uh, this chances of dislodging from power was dependent on this mechanism. When the dissidents uh, and the non-Congress leaders outside with similar ideological leanings collaborated to bring about change uh, in, you know, in the government. Instead of opposition dislodging the government, it was basically done through different mechanism. This is what Kothari explains through this Congress system. And in other words, one can say that under this Congress system, major spaces were occupied by the Congress. And you know, they were opposition parties were only parties to bring about pressure and they were on the margins and the Congress was the party of consensus. It represented a national consensus, uh, you know, on number of issues. Uh, there was a left of the center consensus on economic issues. There was consensus on secularism. There was consensus on nationalism and number of such values one can say that it represented a consensus. So this is what Kothari says that this was the Congress system from 50 to 69. Now after 69, this Congress system declined. 
And Kothari himself wrote in 1974 a paper in Asian Survey, uh, in the journal where he had basically written this piece on Congress system before his politics of politics in India was published. And in this paper, 74, uh, he writes about Congress system revisited, where for the first time he articulated this view that the Congress system which he talked about no longer was in existence and it had declined. And number of reasons he cited for you know, the decline of this Congress system. Uh, you know, breakdown of national consensus, deviation from the left, left of the center, you know, position of the Congress, centralization, and many other tendencies which were basically uh, promoted. And therefore, he argued that the Congress system which he talked of in Nehruvian phase no longer was applicable. Now, this phase, the third phase, has been called by scholars as the phase of uh, you know, altogether a different thing, uh, which I uh, mentioned that the third page was the confrontationist page, uh, particularly Indra JP uh, page that is 71 to 77. 69 is important because 1969 uh, Congress strength dwindled, uh, regional parties uh, gained foothold in many states. 1967 election Congress lost uh, in many states. Then, of course, Congress witnessed a split in 1969 and Mrs. Indira Gandhi became the leader of uh, the you know, party in government and forced her right-wing party colleague, colleagues to leave the party and therefore what came as a Congress organization was basically the fallout of this. Now what happened that Mrs. Gandhi left war tilt at that time through Garibi Hatao, bank nationalization, you know, abolition of PV purses, all were meant to basically cut her uh, you know, adversaries in the Congress who had left, uh, you know, right, you know, wing uh, leaning uh, to size. And therefore, uh, you know, the Congress under Mrs. Gandhi reaped good dividends when she came back to power, bounced back to power, not only bounced back because Congress was already ruling, but, you know, one majority, clear cut majority in 1971, a snap poll. So therefore, uh, this was the beginning of uh, another phase. But what happened, as I mentioned, that immediately, uh, in fact, what happened that she came under direct conflict uh, with some agitational politics which started in Gujarat, Nav Nirman movement spearheaded by Morarji Desai, and, uh, you know, anti-corruption movement in Bihar, which later became famous as uh, JP movement. Now, what happened that new trends emerged in parties, uh, you know, political parties and party system in India? Of course, Mrs. Gandhi... Uh, won the power, uh, won uh, the parliamentary election. She consolidated her leadership. But then also she initiated new trends in Indian politics and particularly from the point of view of party system. She established direct mass, you know, contact with the people at the cost of party organization. The kind of the plural federal party structure which was created after 1952, due to which this Congress system characterization of Kothari was made, uh, that was basically a bidden goodbye. And now, intermediary structure of the Congress, uh, you know, was totally bypassed uh, and power got centralized. Uh, particularly this intermediary structure, both in terms of party organization and the state uh, regional political formations, particularly in terms of the federal polity. So therefore, this Nehruvian era, when one witnessed this institutionalized party organization, uh, that was completely, you know, uh, bidden goodbye. And therefore, one, what one finds that the personal dynastic loyalties were privileged and prioritized over institutional accountability and institutional loyalty. For the first time, we find uh, that in post-independent period, a populist turn in politics started around that time. Of course, populism can have both types, the right-wing populism and the left-wing populism. Here one finds the beginning of left-wing populism with Garibi Hatao, abolition of PV purses, and many other issues. So therefore, this populist politics, and populist politics, when it develops, it develops at the cost of institutional, you know, institutions, democratic institutions, when the leaders directly try to establish contact with the people uh, over uh, the shoulder of uh, institutions and over the shoulder of, uh, you know, other leaders within the party. So therefore, what happened? A pyramidical structure of party uh, got, uh, you know, created. Uh, and that political pyramid was based on extreme centralization, a tendency which was highlighted by 
Professor Rajni Kothari also in his Congress system revisited, as I mentioned, when centralization at the top and the populist mass mobilization through personal and dynastic resources uh, and the charisma of the leader, uh, you know, happened, uh, you know, in this period in place of the old Congress party, which was more pluralistic and federalistic. Now, Kochanek, a very eminent scholar on Indian politics, whose book on business and politics in India is well known. Kochanek said that uh, this could happen uh, because both constitution, India's constitution and the way political parties were uh, operating here. In fact, uh, they were characterized by federal spirit uh, and, uh, you know, federalism as, uh, you know, at, uh, at, uh, federalism and uh, unity tendencies both existing uh, side by side. One can say that they were federal in nature, but unitary biases could not be ruled out. And therefore, this happened in constitution, this happened in political parties, the way their organizations were, uh, you know, uh, you know, institutionalized. And therefore, Mrs. Gandhi could, and this phase, what I mentioned that the confrontation is phase when the populism, centralization, dynastic loyalties and other things uh, emerge, this could happen. Now, the reaction, of course, was extra parliamentary mass movement. When you had the Nav Nirman movement in Gujarat, uh, you know, led by Morarji Deshai, uh, JP movement in Bihar, and All India Railway Strike in 1974, then promulgation of emergency in 1975, and, you know, followed by press censorship, arrest of leaders, and then the reaction which we find 1977, Janta government coming back to power. Of course, the Janta Party was characterized by a number of things. Uh, many parties got merged, but it was not a pure merger because the party also disintegrated on this issue, double membership issue on Jansang and RSS membership, which was highlighted by, uh, you know, Charan Singh parties and the socialists who were there. So this is the third page. The fourth page is the restoration of Congress. That is 1980. Now, 1980, the fourth page, when Mrs. Gandhi comes back to power, followed by Harshan Rajiv Gandhi in 1984. And of course, in this phase, there is no re rebuilding of the pluralist federal Congress party about which we discussed in the first phase, the Congress phase. Here, in fact, what happened that no internal democracy, uh, you know, could be practiced the way it was being practiced in the first phase. And therefore, what happened that neither Congress nor the Janta could restore uh, the institutionalized uh, you know, character of the party system of Nehruvian era. Even the Janta Party could not do this, uh, in spite of the tall claims it made. And therefore, the organizational traits, uh, you know, of centralization and many other evil tendencies which are, uh, you know, surfaced in party system in India, basically, you know, spread like a virus in various political parties, you know, uh, at that time. So, 1980s, uh, in fourth page, there is another feature which helps us understanding this system. The differentiation and distance between party system at the center and at the state. This differentiation and distancing is something very important to remember. Because it is here that we find that this regionalization of polity or regionalization or the you know, importance and prominence of regional parties in Indian politics for the first time showing signs. For example, Andhra 1983, Congress loses power, Telugu Desam Party comes to power, Karnataka Janta Party under Ramakrishna Hegde, National Conference in uh, Andhra, uh, in, uh, in Kashmir, Asham Gan Parishad in Asham, and therefore uh, already, and the separatist movement in Punjab under Akalis, uh, and the Northeast, Northeast and many other uh, you know, areas also witness this separatist movement. So, therefore, what happens that a new phase in party system starts. They started demanding, uh, you know, revisit, uh, revisiting this entire federal arrangement in India. Uh, they had a number of conclaves. The famous conclave was the, you know, Bijawara con conclave of, uh, you know, regional parties. Then the Sarkaria Commission is instituted by Mrs. Indira Gandhi to review central state relations in India. And uh, this is perhaps the beginning of a new era of regionalization, which we find that by 1989, uh, you know, got crystallized in different form when a multi-party system with federal coalition and minority government comes into existence with VP Singh as prime minister, then Narsim Rao as a minority government, then again, you know, uh, this national front, uh, united front, 
then NDA, then UPA1 and UPA2. So, coalition minority phenomenon in India. And finally, the sixth phase that is 2014 when BJP has come back power with clear cut majority, but some of the trends and tendencies in Indian party system still survive. So, this is how one can have an idea of this six phases of Indian party system. With this note, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much, dear friends. If you wish to write to us, do write at info.cc at nic.in. We will be meeting again soon. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again.